Here to talk about all of the cases before the Supreme Court re- regarding the ACA is David Lyle. He's director and senior counsel of Courts Matter for Media Matters for America. David is a graduate of the University of Chicago Law School, served for 10 years as the deputy director of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy. Learn more at MediaMatters.org. David, welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Carl. Thank you so much. Well, yesterday uh, the, the the question was whether this case is image, is premature based on um, that a challenge to the individual mandate is barred by the federal Anti-Injunction Act. I think our listeners know uh, from yesterday what that is. What did you glean from what you saw yesterday? Well, going into the arguments yesterday, people had said that the idea that the Anti-Injunction Act didn't apply uh, in this case was the one thing the parties agreed to. Uh, I think what we found out yesterday is much more importantly, it's also something the justices agreed to. Uh, If the Anti-Injunction Act was going to be an off-ramp that the justices could take to avoid reaching a decision on the key questions in this case, it's pretty clear that they... uh, put their foot on the accelerator and blew past the off-ramp yesterday. Okay. Uh, Yesterday, Chief uh, Justice Roberts said this. He said, the idea of the mandate is something separate from whether you want to call it a penalty or tax doesn't seem to make much sense. It's a command. A mandate is a command. If there is nothing behind the command, well, what happens if you don't file the mandate? The answer is nothing. Why would you have a requirement that is completely toothless? That was a quote from Chief Justice Roberts. A lot of people who feel like this individual mandate constitutionality is going to turn on the Commerce Clause took this comment by the Chief Justice to say maybe the case in his mind is going to turn on Congress's power to tax. Well, that's right. That that comment attracted a lot of attention. Now, we all know that sometimes the justices make points in argument just to, for the sake of argument. And right. You've you got to be careful about reading too much into it. On the other hand, the chief justice is a very careful lawyer, very careful judge, and it may be that he was sending a signal there. I think th- what this shows you, though, is that when you get in, when you move away from the, the high-flown rhetoric about this case and get into what it's really about, what, what you see is that this is not a case about the death of liberty in America. This is, this is a case about uh, most people already have insurance, whether it's through their employer, through Medicaid or Medicare, and for the very small number of people who don't, they will have a choice between either getting insurance or paying a modest, call it what you will, penalty, fee, tax, uh, if they don't. That, that's all this case is about. And so there's, there's really no reason for the court to take the extraordinary step of, of striking down this massive piece of legislation. Our guest is David Lyle, Director and Senior Counsel of Courts Matter for Media Matters for America, MediaMatters.org. Um, David, uh, you, you probably have heard this clip because I picked it off Media Matters, but I want our listeners to hear it along with you. This is former Reagan Solicitor General Charles Freed on Fox News. Professor, how do you respond to the challenger's arguments then that if Congress can regulate this, if they can step into the health insurance market and tell Americans they have to buy something, that there won't be a limit on federal power? They can tell you you have to work out or eat broccoli or buy other kinds of things that would make you healthier. You've heard the argument. How do you respond to that one? Yeah, it's it's totally bogus because, as Judge Sutton pointed out, uh, Everybody isn't in the working out market or in the broccoli market, but everybody is in the health care market or 95 percent of the population. So they're not being forced into a market they're not in. They're being told, they're being regulated in how they pay for things in a market that they are already in and are sure to continue to be in. All right. Former Solicitor General under President Reagan and also Harvard Professor Charles Freed. Uh, we know you've spoken out on the law many times. We will watch the arguments along with you and see what this court ultimately does, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Now, David, that is essentially what you just said. That's right. And, of course, it's not just me who's saying it. Uh, a number of very prominent conservatives, Charles Freed is one. Uh, judge Sutton, who he referenced, right. is a very, very famous uh, conservative judge from Ohio. Judge Silberman uh, in D.C., who's maybe the leading uh, conservative judge in the country, all said 
that there is no basis in the Constitution's text or history for the arguments that the opponents uh, of the law are making. And, you know, it, it kind of takes us back a little bit. Whenever positive change is happening in this country, it turns out uh, that people on the other side say it's the death of liberty, right? That's what Social yep. Security was going to be. Medicare. That's, what, that's right. Medicare was going to be the Civil Rights Act. And they make up these nightmare scenarios. So in this case, we have the broccoli mandate. Right. Well, when, when uh, the minimum wage was passed, people said, well, what, what's going to stop Congress from making the minimum wage be $5,000 an hour? Well, here's what would stop it. First of all, Congress would never do it. And if they did, a court would say, you can't do that, right? And so that's what would happen in the case of a broccoli mandate. With the Civil Rights Act, it was, well, if you tell someone who owns a lunch counter which customers, that he has to serve all customers, or he has to hire all potential qualified employees, regardless of race, what's going to stop the government from saying what color the tablecloths in the, in the restaurant can be? Well, you know, that didn't happen either. And the broccoli mandate is not going to happen in this case. It's just completely made up. Our guest, David Lyle, who's director and senior counsel of Courts Matter, MediaMatters.org. David, um, the, the question in the back of my mind, and I'll bet it's in the back of a lot of people's minds, is whether the court is going to follow, and specifically, I guess, the conservative justices are going to follow case law or whether politics is going to be involved here. If you look at Gonzalez versus Raich, for instance, which our Attorney General John Kroger has cited in supporting the constitutionality of the individual mandate, that is a decision that uh, Antonin Scalia concurred in. And and yet there seemed to be the question about politics, whether the conservative justices are just going to swipe this down because it's Obamacare. Your thoughts? Well, I mean, there, that's right. That's one of the things about this case is it, it certainly could go either way. Um, but there's also a good chance that there could be a significant uh, ma majority of the conservative justices joining. There could be uh, Justice Scalia, as you said, in the Rage case where he found someone growing uh, marijuana in their basement for their own use to be a form of commerce that Congress could regulate. You know, that certainly seems... Uh, a little less significant than the entire healthcare industry in the United States, one sixth mm -hmm. of the gross national product. Um, and and uh, Chief Justice Roberts, in other cases, uh, has been very uh, broad in his sense of what federal power can be. So there's there's a chance that there could be up to seven votes for the for wow. upholding the the mandate. David, uh, tomorrow the arguments in the morning will be about severability. Whether if the individual mandate were to be struck down, whether the rest of the act is constitutional. I believe there's one judge that threw it all out. Um, what do you think about that? That's right. Well, I think it's it, there's less much less of a chance uh, that the entire uh, law will be struck down. The, the judge in Florida who, who did strike down the whole law also included a specific shout-out to the Tea Party in his opinion. So <laughs> I, 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 I don't think his views are going to carry a lot of weight at this point. Maybe, maybe with Mrs. Clarence Thomas it would. That, that's right. But what, Virginia. People, <laughs> but what people need to be very clear about is uh, that maybe the single most popular part of the entire law the ban on pre-existing conditions, the rule that says insurance companies can no longer say you've been sick once so you can never get insurance again, that is, that is if, the, if the mandate goes, the ban on pre-existing conditions goes. Uh, the government concedes that. Uh, you can wonder about whether they should have conceded that, but, but they have. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, you know, a lot of things in the law may still stand, but, but the single... Uh, thing that, that I think a lot of people, when you, when you poll and when you talk to people, say, boy, you know, that's one thing I'm really happy happened. It was really terrible the way insurance companies can treat people. That part, the, the ban on pre-existing conditions, is, gonna, is linked to the mandate, and if the mandate uh, rises, it rises, and if the mandate falls, it falls. Right. David, one last question. Thanks for spending time with us. Are different lawyers arguing different uh, parts of this case? 
Uh, that's right. And part of, there are there are individual parties uh, there, and there. But the and then on the uh, the court has appointed lawyers to argue certain points that it wanted to make sure were fully brought out. And then of course the the government lawyers, the solicitor general, is defending the law. Who, who are the big stars here uh, in in court as far as the lawyers? Who gets the most say? Do you think? Well, the, I mean, the solicitor people sometimes refer to the solicitor general as the tenth justice. But I think the court does uh, give a lot of deference to the views of the government. However, the government doesn't always win. On the other side, you have Paul Clement, who was uh, George Bush's solicitor general, who is arguing all the going around the country, arguing all the big conservative uh, uh, ideological cases. Now mm-hmm. he's doing this case. He's defending the Defense of Marriage Act on behalf of the House of Representatives too. Uh, David, very enlightening. Our guest has been David Lau, Director and Senior Counsel of Courts Matter for Media Matters for America. Learn more at MediaMatters.org. David, thanks so much. Great to be with you, Carl. Thank you.